Have you ever noticed that uh, whenever you think of a, a certain person, it'll bring you back to a certain era? Like when I think of my friend Trevor, it's my senior year of college. And actually, even there are people that you may have been with them for a long period of time, but it will bring you back to a certain season. I was thinking about one friend in particular. It's interesting. I just called him a friend. I definitely don't think he would have called me a friend. Um, there's a certain person that I always think of when I think of my eighth grade year. Um, his name was Jim. And Jim was one of those kids that would be on the outside of every social circle. Jim didn't wear the right shoes. You see, it, when I was in eighth grade, you needed to wear Nikes. And he wore Nikes, but the problem was his Nikes were old and they were the wrong size and they came from the Goodwill. And Jim didn't smell quite right. And Jim wasn't as smart as the rest of us. And Jim didn't play sports. And we were brutal. I said we. Sorry. I was brutal to Jim. And when I look back at Jim, the thing I think of, there's a banner over the top of my picture of Jim, and it's regret. Because how I treated him is heartbreaking. And I've often wondered where Jim ended up in his life and the choices that he made. And I wondered if he heard my voice, my cruel voice, speaking in his ear, saying that you're not good enough, you don't wear the right shoes, and you don't smell right. I wonder how much I broke Jim's heart. We're in the middle of a sermon series called We, where we're looking at relationships, healthy relationships. And last week, Pastor Paul challenged us with an equation that said, if we want a healthy we, it's an equation of we, which equals God plus me. Well, we can't have that in isolation because we really have to come back to this other part of how does that play out with others? And today I want to look at that. We're in Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at a parable. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the background for this. This is Jesus talking to a, a group of Jewish people, and he's talking about a little background for you. He's talking about the, at the end of times, all of people will be divided into two separate groups. On the right will be the sheep, and they're the positive ones. And then on the left, you'll have goats, the sheep and the goats. And as he lays it out, he says to them, you're in these two positions because of how you responded to me how you responded to me. And so they're, they're both thinking, well, how did I respond to God? How did I respond to Jesus? But he flips a little something on there that really changes it. The thing that he says to them, he says to this, uh, when he's, this is the one when he talks to the sheep. He says almost the exact same thing to both of them. This is the one to the sheep. He says, the king will say to those on the right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Congratulations, you are in. And then he says, here's why, for, that means why. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Look at this, what a joy this is. You've done everything needed for me. And they asked a question. And I love this because the sheep asked a question and the goats asked the exact same question. Neither of them knew when did we ever see you like this? And you, at one point, you got to say, like, so you're in prison, huh? What were you in for? I don't know, Uncle in Leavenworth. Like, how, how does this work? And then he says to them, well, let, let me explain it to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Quite simply, whatever you did to the lowest of the low, that bottom person, the outcast, the person that you couldn't stand, the person that had hurt you, Whatever you did to them, that was me. And what I love about this is if we, if we tie in from last week, we have the sheep on the right and we have the goats on the left. And both of them are asking, when did we see this? Here's what I think happens. When God works in your heart, last week Paul talked about abide with him. He talked about the vine and when you abide in him, what changes is the fruit that comes out of it. Here's the fruit. Let me back it up and show you. You start clothing people who need clothes. You start feeding people who need food. You start caring for people, even if they are the least of these. You're the fruit that comes out because you're abiding with him as it changes the way you relate to others. See, the we really is God plus me. But where you're going to see it all play out is how you treat other people. And I want to I wanna work this with you with a simple question, because this is going to be different in each of our lives. I want to ask this question, who is the least? Now, wherever you are, you might be in a home, you might be in a fellowship group, or you might be at a campus. We're going to pause for a second, and we're going to let you talk in church. I want you to talk to the person next to you and say, who is the least? Just talk it out real quick. Answer the question real quickly. Now, 
Now, some of you have an obvious answer. Maybe you have someone in your life that's like Jim. Jim would fit into that. As I said, he was the lowest of the low. On, in, the, in the pecking order of eighth grade, he was on the bottom rung. But are there other people? Perhaps you have someone that's like Jim, and you're immediately thinking of that. But I want to expand this today. And perhaps what's going to happen today is the Holy Spirit's going to work on your heart. And if you're abiding in him, if the Holy Spirit is working in you, you may see, we may open our eyes to see, there may be other people that are actually fit under the least of these that you are called to love, to feed, to clothe, to visit, to join them. And the first of these that I'd like to, to point out to you is I think there are the down and out. When I ask my friends, we would look at this text and I'd say, hey, who do you think this is for? The most common answer is, well, who's hungry, who's thirsty, and who's been in prison? You would usually say, well, homeless people, people that have made poor choices. So how we treat them is, remember what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. How we treat them is how we're treating Jesus. And I think that that's totally true. And again, I think that this is where Jim fits in. But I don't think this is the only place. And I think it's important for us to say, are there people that are down and out that God has placed in our lives that we need to reach out and love? Because that is a representation of Jesus Christ. And how I'm loving that other is how I'm loving him. And if you could see it this way, I don't know what picture you have of Jesus in your mind. But if you see that person, I need to put Jesus' face on and say, I am going to love Jesus. And I, here's what's interesting is you may think of yourself as I'm not down and out. I completed school, I got a job, I keep a job, I'm not down and out because of the, and this is what we think, because of the choices that I made. And here's what, unintentionally, probably, you're thinking, you know why they're down and out? Because of what they did. And let me, let me remind you something. The gospel says this, I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner, and here's what you deserve. You deserve to be separated from God and you deserve hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If you don't remember this, maybe this is the day where you need to be reminded. You are a down and out if it weren't for Jesus. You don't deserve it either. And so when you see that person, you say, look at the choices they made. Your choices on their own without Jesus saving you, you end up in hell, away from God as well. So hear that very clearly. You are not above the down and out, although it's very tempting to put yourself there. There's another group of people, and I'm going to tell you, I'm inferring this. The text is really talking about just the two groups and about feeding and caring and about needs, and I totally um, get that. But I, I realize that when it comes to me, when I think of the least, I'm thinking of two other groups that fit into this. And one of them is anyone that fits on the other side. And you're saying, well, the other side of what? The other side of anything that I don't agree with them on. I don't, I don't know your age bracket here, but if you were alive in the 80s and early 90s, the entire premise of how people would do their advertising was based on love-hate. They would pit one company against another company with this intent. You had to pick a side. In fact, one of them, this is a, I don't know if you can remember this if you're older. This is Chevy versus Ford. This was huge. Every Chevy commercial also had a Ford in it, and they hated each other back and forth. Chevy would make a commercial about a Ford. A Ford would make a commercial back and forth. Another one, this is the, the caffeine wars of the 80s, uh, Coke versus Pepsi. And here's what they did. They sparked the two most important emotions, love and hate. Do you know they use the, actually the same neurological pathways to love something and hate something? It's the same emotional movement. Here's what's funny about it. Well, what if you don't like either? That wasn't an option. You're going to buy into one or the other. Like, what if you're like, um, I just want a mocha. Nope, doesn't work. It went all the way through sports too. It was Celtics versus Lakers. By the way, go Celtics. Hate the Lakers and everything they stand for. A little bit later on, you had Mac versus PC. All across the board, it was love, hate, love, hate. And you would get people to side on one side and hate the other side. And it was all about creating tension so that you had to pick a side. And this has not stopped. It's not necessarily as prevalent in advertising, but it is prevalent in other places. It's prevalent right here. It's funny, there's a lot more tension right now. And a few, few seconds ago, I was talking about Coke and Pepsi, and you were laughing with each other on which side you pick, or Ford versus Chevy, or Mac versus PC but now you have all the weight of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
You have the weight of the nation, and some of us are feeling the tension. Let me just ask you a simple question. What are you feeling? Because when you see this picture, some of you are feeling hatred. I don't even know which side you're, you're looking at that you're hating, but I know that there's hatred. I know that there's anger. I know that there's fear. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. How do you love the least of these? What do you do with someone who's on the other side? Not of Coke versus Pepsi, but of something that really matters to you. Is your only option to try and convince why your side is better? Or can you say, I will give food to the hungry? I can't do that. They, they, I don't agree with them. Let me come back to the gospel. Remember what we said about the down and out? We are all the down and out. And I want to give you something even more profound, something so much deeper. This idea of the other side, what I'm actually saying is, what do you do if they're your enemy? If they don't love what you love, in fact, if they stand in opposition to what you love, can you love them beyond that? Because here's the gospel. While we were still sinners, while we were the enemies of God, Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, came as a baby on Christmas morning, died on a cross, and three days later on Easter morning, rose from the dead. Why? Because he loved an enemy. You. And me. So I ask you a simple question. What, what's your plan on loving people that you don't agree with? Some of you think that they need Jesus, and, and there's a subtle thing that you have there. They need to come to Jesus because if they came to Jesus, then they would agree with you. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that they would become that political part. It's not true. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son for the purpose of salvation. And what your enemy needs is not a change of mind, but the heart of Jesus living inside of him or her. For what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. I'll put this in another way. There's a little bit more. It's not just the down and out, and it's not just the other side. What happens if the person that you're looking at is really your enemy? Jesus says this 20 chapters earlier. He says it, and he's doing a sermon, and he says, you've heard it said to love your neighbor. That's easy. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He's sending this out, the basic idea of love. And how do we practice that out? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. So as I look at those two, the down and out and the outsider, I see more to it than that. There's something more profound happening. I think there's someone more difficult to love than just those who are down and out or those who are on the other side. I think there's also those who have inflicted pain. In fact, when you think of them, you cannot think of them without thinking of the hurt that they have caused you. I just had a realization as I'm talking with you here. As I'm saying this, you may be thinking of someone that hurt you. If Jim were watching this, he may be thinking of me. Jim never hurt me. But I know I hurt him. And I don't know if you were listening to this, he would have to say, answer this question. How would I love someone like Will? because Will's not very lovable. And that's what he would be looking at right there. Let me ask you a simple question. Who's hurt you? I think there's a way that we sometimes look at the equation. Remember, it's we equals God plus me plus others. I think sometimes this is how we focus on it. Now, I don't know how much you remember your algebraic order of operations. Algebra is a math class, by the way. I, math teachers are loving this right now. In the order of operations for algebra, Here's the way it functions. Whatever is inside the parentheses, you do that first. This is how we function a lot of the time. When I have a problem, when I have someone that's hurt me, I often think of them. The way I picture this is I am driving, I'm somewhere alone, and I start having a conversation with them in my head. And I am the only one talking, and I'm telling them what's wrong, because hurt, they've hurt me, and so I'm explaining to them what's wrong. Now, where does that ever take us? It doesn't ever take us to a healthy place. In fact, there's a, there's a church term, and I know this is totally churchy, and if you're not from a church background, I'm going to explain it for you. There's a word called repent, and it's a basic idea is you're going the wrong way, and repentance man, means I'm going to realize I've gone the wrong way, 
And I'm going to turn and go the other way. That's repentance. U-turn would be a good term for that. Here's what I think a great picture of mental repentance is. You're driving along and you're thinking to yourself of all of the horrible things this person who has hurt you has done. And then you flip it and say, wait a minute. You stop that train of thinking. You stop the conversation and you flip it around. And instead, you change the order of operations. You begin with God and me. You begin maybe by saying, God, I'm angry right now. God, I'm hurt. I'm upset with them. And you just bring it to him and you start there. And it's amazing what begins to happen when my, when my thinking first is me and God, then others. Because remember this, with the others, when, when you're looking at this and, and you're struggling and you're, you're trying to process this and they've done something that's hurt you and everything you're seeing them through, you're seeing them through a filter of pain. Well, what happens if you picture that person? And I want you right now to picture the person that's caused you the most pain. Could be someone that you work with. Could be someone that you're related to. Could be a mother or a child. Could be a spouse. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture that person. Now I want you to picture the face of Jesus covering them. And here's, because here's the essence of it. What you've done to the least of these, and sometimes the least are the people that have caused you the most pain. That this idea that I am connected with God, I am putting a picture of God over the top of that. Because what you've done for the least of these, you've done to me. The Apostle Paul says it this way. We were supposed to bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. The Lord forgave you. As I, I think about this, uh, I can't help but think about this in the life of my family. I'm going to share with you a little background of some people that had a profound impact on my family from three generations ago. This is Tojo, and this is the Emperor Hirohito. They were the leaders of Japan in the 30s, and they made a decision. They thought that it was important for Japan to control all of Southeast Asia. And in the process, the United States went to war with Japan. And because of that, my grandfather, at age 17, lied about his age. This is my granddaddy. Lied about his age and enlisted in the Marines. And of course, the Marines took him. And because of Tojo and Admiral, or Emperor Hirohito, he ended up on the beaches of Iwo Jima. He survived physically, but he was one of those who made it back, but never made it home. And the scars that he brought home with him were profound. And his scars led to scars on other people, including my dear sweet grandmother, including my mom, and including my uncle. There were things that were done and things that were said that broke hearts. At one point, my grandmother had to have a restraining order against her husband. Now, he was a follower of Jesus, but there was something so profoundly broken in him at one point during the restraining order, my grandfather would drive up and down the street scaring them. And my grandmother took my two-year-old uncle and my 10-year-old mom. And the only place they could hide, they turned out all the lights, closed all the blinds, and hid in the hallway because it was the only place that didn't have a window. Because he would walk up and around the house and scared them half to death. And there's a voice that echoes down the corridor of time. What you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So how does my grandmother respond? At one point, she was given the advice by a pastor that said, you can go ahead and divorce him. He had committed um, adultery. She had every right, but she felt the Holy Spirit saying, what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. And though she protected herself when it needed, because abuse needs to be protected against, she also chose to reach out in love. And I remember a story that my grandmother told about she and my grandfather. Near the end of his life, my, my grandfather ended up being committed into the hospital. They're, my family's from Portland. They ended up being committed into a hospital, a VA hospital in Roseburg, Oregon. And my mom grew up driving from Portland to Roseburg to visit her troubled father. In fact, my, my parents live here now. The idea of moving here was really hard for my mom for a long time because her memory of Roseburg was the VA hospital and a broken father. But at one point nearing the end of my grandfather's life, he had a lot of physical problems. Um, he, had, um, he had a lot of shaking in his hands. 
partly from the shock treatment that they gave him to try and fix him. Let's give electrical shocks to people when they have a broken spirit. Let's not worry about Jesus. And in the process, one time he went to light a cigarette and he dropped a cigarette and caught himself on fire and he had third degree burns all over his front. And his esophagus, I don't know why, but it was closing up, it was constricting and you basically couldn't put a, a pin needle down through it. It was just closing up on him. And my grandmother remembers at one point at this stage, he said to her, can I just have some soup? And I thought about that verse. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Of all the people to say no to, I feel like my grandma had every right to say, no, are you kidding me? Look what you've done. But grandma went into the kitchen and made some soup. Because what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. And it may very well be that the person that has broken your world your only option is to see them like Jesus. That or bitterness will destroy you. And if you ever met my grandmother, my grandfather actually died when I was about two, so I don't, I don't remember him. But I know my grandmother. And if you looked at my grandmother, you would say the word grace would echo out of her. And the grace I saw in her, I think, was practiced before I was born. It was practiced on a husband that didn't love her well. But her response changed everything. And it began a legacy that was different from the legacy that my grandfather had started. And I have to say, I'm very grateful for my grandmother. I remember the last time I saw her. The last time I saw her was the first time she ever saw my little boy. My son's eight now. Grandma was laying in a hospital bed and it was dying of cancer. Um, she slept most of the day, but I went in there with a the little boy. He was probably a month old, and I said, Grandma, your, grand your great-grandson wants to say hi. And so she woke up and said, oh. And for about four minutes, she held her, her grandson. You know what I, I want? I want her great-grandson to live out the grace that she exuded in stories that she lived out before I was born, but that I saw in her that echoed out. As she would talk about her husband, there was a sweetness in her voice. Sometimes we, uh, we talk about people that have hurt us, and our very tone is condescending, and the pain echoes through. I think my grandmother healed, but I think she didn't heal because my grandfather died. I think she healed because of how she loved him when he was alive. It's one of the things that I notice he says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I needed clothes. That one of the ways that you love them is you love them by caring for their needs. And you may think to yourself, I actually don't know anyone that needs food, water, or clothes. We live in a very abundant society. But let me flip that for you. I want you to picture the person maybe that you work with that you cannot stand. And the next time there's a meeting, you bring them a mocha. Make sure that they like mocha, okay? I mean doing something loving, that you provide for a need that's not necessarily one of the needs that says, I will live or die based on it. But you simply say, I'm going to love today beyond our past. Meet them in their need. Another thing that I think was so interesting, he says, I was sick and you came to visit me. In some translations say, I was in the hospital and you came to visit me. There was this part of, there was a problem. I was in pain and I mattered to you. I was uh, reading an article. Um, one of our elders sent me an article about empathy. And he was talking about the relationships that doctors have. And when doctors are all about fixing problems, they cause more problems versus when, when doctors come in and they bring empathy. There was a guy who was just straight out of um, med school. And he's um, on the wing for an oncologist. And he has to go in and he has to go tell a patient, it's time to put you on hospice. But he had learned the difference between just doing just solving the problem and meeting with people. He came and he met, the, met her in her pain and, and she was broken. She was worried about her kids. This is a woman dying of breast cancer in her 50s. And he sat and he listened. He sat and he cared. He sat with her in her pain and he said to her, I have two small children as well. I feel for you. He didn't try and fix it. He just came into the pain. This is something I dream of being able to do. The idea that I could sit like that. The next day, the doctor was walking down the hall and that lady said to him, you're the best doctor I've ever met. 
Why? He didn't fix anything. No, but he did this biblical principle of meeting people in their pain. There's one more part of this that I, that I noticed. And that I, you can flip right by it, but it actually says, I was in prison and you came to visit me. You know what kind of shame follows prison? I've never been in prison, and I've had the chance to visit a few people who were arrested, so I got to go down and visit some people in the jail, maybe three or four times. But there's a lot of weight that's carried with this because there's a lot of shame that goes on this. One of my closest friends, Daniel, has spent time in prison. He spent 11 months in prison, and he said one of the hardest things was it fractured the relationship between him and his mom. In the 11 months that he was in, he did not have a conversation with his mother. And then after prison, it was a year before she would talk to him. Why? Because shame is a powerful enemy. And one of the things I would ask you to think about, if you're thinking of the least, sometimes it means stepping into the shame area. It may even cost you your reputation. I was talking with Pastor Ed, and he was explaining this to me at one point in his life when he was in high school. They would do skating parties, roller skating parties. And he said that when, one time when they were out doing a, one of the roller skating times, there were two, two girls that were special needs, um, the type that they would pass along. They didn't really get grades. They would just pass them along so they'd get through high school. And he said, you know, they didn't smell. They didn't smell quite right. But they came up to him and said, would you skate with me? And Ed said, yes. Despite what anyone else would say, I'm with you. And, and let me tell you wh why I think it was. Because what, what Pastor Ed saw was what you've done to the least of these you've done to me. And so Ed went skating with Jesus. And Jesus didn't smell quite right. And Jesus wasn't all that bright. But Ed skated with Jesus. And did it cost him Ed, part of his reputation? Probably. Was it worth it? I think so. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I don't know which of these three sections of people resonates more with you. The down and out, the people that you see as an enemy, or perhaps someone that's wounded you, deeply wounded you. Here's what I want you to remember. It's Jesus. And how you treat them is how you're treating him. I'm going to release to the Green and the Sutherland campus, uh, and we're going to ask you a question here. I love you guys, and I'll see you next time. For those of you still watching at home, or maybe you're in a fellowship group, we've got a question for you. And I want you to have this conversation. We want you to have this dialogue for you to consider what this means for you. So we want you to have a little discussion that says this. What is one way you can show love to someone this week? And I want you to think of it in terms of those three sets of people. People that are the outsiders, people that are, have caused you a great deal of pain, and perhaps it's someone uh, that's down and out. But in your little groups, I want you to talk about which one you're called to, and I know this might be a little bit more vulnerable sharing. It can be powerful. I love you. Let me close in prayer, and then we can get to it. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for that you loved us, though we are down and out, and that you loved us, though we deserve something so much less, because we are your enemies because of our sin. And you have been deeply wounded. In fact, you hung on the cross when we were nailing you to the cross. And you said, Father, forgive them. How gracious you are with the pain that we have caused. And we love you, Jesus. God, I pray that you would grow in us the same love that we see in you. In your name we pray. Amen.